Hey, hello. How are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. You learn a lot just innately from watching TV or watching movies. You, on some level, if you're paying attention, are processing what you like or don't like or what works or doesn't work. You need to recognize that just as much as your idea can make someone else's thing better, and that's the value you bring, is that someone else has an idea or a joke or something that is better than your own. You can't be precious about everything that you pitch or you create. I felt both Chinese and white and also not Chinese and not white and never othered. I was actually, I think, very proud and excited to be half Asian. It felt special and unique. The idea to make a short film was born out of, I want to just make something that I actually wrote and get to share it with people. It was a cool and worthwhile experience to appreciate all the other ways to tell what you need to tell. I feel like you have to enjoy the pure part of the process because that's like what 99% of your time will be spent doing, you know? If I'm only just waiting for the audience response for like the 30 minutes that end up being made that come out months later, that's not going to sustain me. Like what's going to sustain me is enjoying the messiness and the fun of that writer's room all day. Hi there, this is Fei Wu, and you're listening to the Face World Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest on the show. His name is Ben Smith. Ben is a writer, producer, and director. His most recent project is for the popular HBO TV show called Barry, for which he worked on as a writer and co-producer. Prior to that, he wrote for Trophy Wife on ABC, Benched on USA, Other Space on the Yahoo streaming platform, Santa Clarita Diet on Netflix with Drew Barrymore, plus his own projects, Gentlemen Lobsters and Meet Cute. Born and raised in Lexington, Massachusetts, Ben's mom is Chinese, so we were able to talk about what it means to be growing up multicultural. Since most writers in Hollywood still are white male, Ben talks about diversity and why it's important in a writer's room. Still in his 20s, you may be wondering how Ben got his first job and survived the competitive landscape of not only being a writer, but talented and lucky enough to work his way up. He's incredibly humble and shared his own experience since college. Moving from the East Coast to the West, currently living in LA, is a big change. Not to mention both of Ben's parents are doctors. He talks about how he pursued a different career that's not linear but nebulous compared to his parents in medicine. We ask our guests a lot about their creative process. Ben's writing process is quite a lesson for me to learn as well. If for nothing else, you'll find out why we should embrace deadlines and other constraints. Lots of goodies, gems in this episode, and I really hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Because of these wonderful projects Ben worked on, please visit our blog, faceworld.com, F-E-I-S-W-O-R-L-D, for many additional links and resources. As always, I welcome your comments and feedback in making Face World better. And remember, sharing is love, so please consider sharing this episode with one more person. So Ben, after meeting you, I literally binge watched uh, the entire series of Barry on HBO. Right? I remember mm-hmm. HBO, and I was insanely curious to talk to you as a writer, as a co-producer. Um, Could you maybe tell us a bit um, about the show without giving away any plots, if that's even easier? In case some listeners haven't even watched, like what is? What is the show about and how, how did that project kind of come to you, kind of landed on your lap? 
Sure. So Barry is this show on HBO created by and starring Bill Hader from SNL and a bunch of movies. And basically he plays this character, this ex-Marine who is depressed and he's a hitman and he takes a job in LA. And while there, he follows someone who happens to be in an acting class and he kind of gets pulled into the acting class and he's a terrible actor but finds that he absolutely loves it. And it's the story about this person who is very good at killing, but it brings him no joy and is a terrible actor and who wants to kind of transition into the acting world, although it is very difficult to extract yourself from this hitman underworld. And so it was a project that Bill and the co-creator Alec Berg um, had set up at HBO and kind of with many of the jobs that I get, I'm unaware of them until my agents kind of uh, bring it to my attention and their job and their function and, and their, their great resource they provide is that they're aware of shows and they are aware of the people making them and they connect me with these creators. And so uh, I got brought in and met with Bill and Alec, uh, loved their vision for the show and then worked on season one. Wow. And You know, for us, just as watchers of these wonderful creations, how long does it take, you know, between you writing, I know there's a writer's room, writing the show versus the launch of the series? I often don't know, like, is do you finish writing for the whole thing or do these episodes get released even prior to the completion of the story or the vision? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And it varies from project to project. So HBO's, this one was very unique in that they have a very uh, limited release schedule. Like HBO only airs original programming on Sundays, and so they only have a couple shows at a time. And so what it really means is there's a lot of time for the creative to make their product and really perfect it before they... There's no rush to air it. And so we actually wrote, Barry, I want to say the fall of 2017 and didn't air for like or maybe even 2016, no, 2016, because I remember it was during the election, uh, fall of 2016, and then didn't air until 2018. Um, so that was a very unique experience. But other times, like I worked on a show on ABC where episode we were working on like episode, writing episode 10, filming episode 12, and airing episode 7. And so they're all kind of happening at the same time. You're keeping track of it, and it's a very different experience of kind of watching it while you're still working on it, seeing the fan response and reaction while you're still working on the project. Uh, So it varies from show to show. How hard is it? I mean, how often does it happen when you're, especially your friends or uh, your your fans to kind of try to probe what happens next? I mean, does it happen? (laughs) People trying to find out what happens next. People do ask what is going to happen next. uh, And sometimes they say an idea and you're like, that's great, but we've already written it. (laughs) And like, we can't do that idea or you keep it close to your chest. What's going on? You're, I'm, you know, I'm often very excited for people to see what happens next. You know, last time we talked about writing and I was thinking to myself, like, let's save some of these questions getting really juicy. You talked about a writer's room. I've only heard that term before. Could you help paint a picture of like what it, what it looks like, who's in it and who's doing what? So yeah, on a day-to-day basis, you go into the writer's room. They're laid out differently from show to show, but for the most part, it's like a big table with chairs around it. And there are about 10 writers, depending on the project. And you basically just sit around the table all day working together. Uh, so it's not like going to your own office or you know, working from home. When you're on a show, you're in the office every day. And uh, there's the showrunner, who's kind of the head writer. And they kind of manage... The conversation. So they decide right now we're talking about larger ideas for the whole season. Now we're narrowing in and figuring out what the main story is, the B story, and kind of the small little runner for episode two. Uh, let's stop and now talk about this character. Who is this character? What is their history? What is their what's funny about them? What's interesting? And they kind of yeah direct where conversation should be. And the rest of the writer's job is to pitch ideas to go off of the decisions the showrunner's making. So that's early on, and we'll kind of do big picture stuff. We'll narrow in on specific episodes, and we'll work as a group to outline each episode. That episode is then assigned to one writer who goes off for about a week or so, 
writes the first draft of that episode based on the outline that the whole group worked on. They come back with that script and then the whole room kind of rewrites it together. So what does an outline look like? uh, And all of these things do vary based on the preference of the showrunner and kind of the style that they like. But an outline typically is kind of like broken into scenes. And it's like in this scene, the location, the time, and it breaks down kind of just like the plot in prose of what happens in that scene. Uh, kind of the beats, you know, where we begin, the middle, the end. Uh, in comedies in particular, it'll include some jokes. And it basically should be enough to take home with you and know what is happening in that scene narratively, what the purpose is, how it moves the story to the next. You know, some people make outlines that are very specific and there's not much room for kind of discovery on your own. And then some of them are a little looser. And it's like, these are the points that we know we need to hit. But then during your week at home writing, kind of find that extra flavor and that extra fun. Are plots or maybe conclusions, I'm using words probably not really industry standard, but are conclusions typically given in the outline? Meaning like, could you kind of uh, deviate from the original plot or kind of create new stories? Typically wouldn't. Uh, I mean, during that week off, maybe you reach out to the creator or the showrunner and be like, hey, I'm, I've been working through it. I'm finding this little problem. I had this idea uh, and maybe you could make a change. I, there's definitely room for for changes in your own voice to come through, but I think it's also valuable just to kind of do it as prescribed by the outline and then come in and then when the whole group is rewriting, you can share kind of like, I had trouble in this part. I found when I was working on this that we thought this would be easy, but it feels like there's too much information in the scene. It's a little confusing, like what the most important piece is. And you know the script better than anyone because you've spent the most time with it. And so that week, even if you stick to the outline, you might have new insight in the story that at the outline phase wasn't apparent that it's too much is going on or the motivation isn't clear. We didn't actually figure that out. As you're talking about this, I'm thinking how much of what we learned in school, and in this case, what you learned in school, uh, how did you, where did you acquire those skills? Like, do you think it was in school or mostly on on the job? Hmm. I definitely learned more in like my first week at my first show than I had up to that point. It was kind of remarkable to be like, oh, I thought I knew what was going on. And then clearly I have a lot to learn. And a lot of that is due to my good incredible coworkers who took it upon themselves to teach me and to make it an environment where it's easy to learn. But it's a good question. So I feel like you learn a lot just innately from watching TV or watching movies. You, on some level, if you're paying attention, are processing what you like or don't like or what works or doesn't work. If you are cognizant and like aware of conversations you have or stories you hear, interactions you just like pick up on how people talk to each other or what makes you nervous or what makes you excited, how to kind of like the stories and the unspooling of stories that makes you feel something. So I think a lot of it, you kind of learn if you're just aware of what's going on around you or what you pick up. And then I think in the writer's room, I kind of like learned the language to kind of articulate what I'd been observing for years, if that makes sense, that, oh, this is how you might want to structure something to create that feeling. So you, you're familiar with the feeling already, and now someone is telling you just the language of uh, defining what you'd already been thinking. Um, so you brought up your first project. Could you tell us a bit of maybe about your first project and what was it like to be the rookie on that? Yeah, so the first show I ever worked on was the show called Trophy Wife. It was on ABC back in 2013. It was an ensemble family comedy. And uh, it was an amazing experience for me. It was the largest writer's room I've ever been in. So it was like 15 of us. And I was the youngest writer and the lowest level writer. And I didn't really know what to expect going into it or how all the other writers would treat me as kind of this new young person. Uh, But they were incredibly supportive. They took me under their wing. I think a big part of that was that all of those writers were very secure in who they were and had no ego. And it was all about kind of making the best product. And so while they were all experienced, there was never like infighting between them as to whose vision would win out. uh, And they truly believed that the best idea could come from anywhere in the room. And so they 
gave me plenty of opportunities. I got to write two scripts of my own. I got to be on set during the filming of my scripts. I got to participate, give notes on editing, casting. I learned a lot in that I was exposed to everything and given an opportunity to everything and people were available for questions and, and guidance. One thing I appreciated a lot or learned a lot was just like simple story structure and really distilling scenes down to what is important about them. I remember because when I first went into writing in this comedy room and feeling like I had to prove myself, I would write these outlines or these story areas, which are even shorter outlines. And it, I really focus on like the jokes, like what is really funny about this and being in a comedy room, I think you wanted, or I wanted to like say I belong here by writing jokes and feedback was very helpful in like strip out the unnecessary detail. Like it's good to have a joke or two just to make it a fun read, but really what is the plot? What is the purpose of this scene? Because if you can pull it out and the story still works, then that scene, you don't need it. So like, uh, which was a really good emphasis, especially with television and, t- and comedy, which is only 22 minute episodes. You don't have like a lot of room for unnecessary story and you need a lot of jokes and you have to have space for jokes. So it's really trying to make sure the story is economical and well told. Hi there, this is Fei Wu, and thank you for listening to the Face World podcast. Today on our show, I'm joined by Ben Smith, writer, producer, director. His most recent project is HBO's top show, Barry. Coming from a multicultural background, Ben is often the diversity in a writer's room. Discover his journey from college to being a recognized writer in Hollywood. And uh, how do you start a story? How do you end the story uh, to make it so engaging? But I just feel like the start and the people remember the beginning and the end. And it's so hard. Like as a writer, you probably don't want to disappoint someone or like, you know, lose them at the very start. Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know that there's when as you were asking, it, I was trying to think of my answer in my head. And I was like, oh, I feel like there are a lot of different ways I have gone about mm. coming up with the story. And sometimes it's just like, a moment that you know is correct, you know, or some scene. I mean, uh, when we get to these stories in the room, sometimes it starts from, a, we know a starting place. We know, especially a show like Barry or this other show, Santa Clarita Diet that I've worked on, which are serialized, which basically means that e- there's one story in each episode is picking up where it left off. You kind of know where you ended the last one. And there is a very simple version of storytelling, which is like, and then what? And you've asked kind of like, what is the honest response of these characters? These characters have found themselves in this position. What would they do to get out of it? Or what would they do to move forward? And so that can just get you going. Sometimes you are kind of locked into a moment already based on the previous episode. But other shows that are more episodic, which just basically means it's a standalone episode, more or less kind of like a Seinfeld or a modern family where there is the same characters, but the story's kind of reset. It is kind of finding a core idea or a, or a storyline or a moment that feels interesting. Again, you can build forward or go back, like, how did we get here? What are the natural choices or what would follow? I think that the stories that work though, it's a, it's a very easy to come up with a plot idea or a big moment or like that big thing that happens in the third act where it's the messiest or the characters are at their lowest point. But then for the story to really work, the writer's room will stop and say like, what is this story about? Because it can't just be the plot. It's, oh, this is a story about this thing that happens in the workplace. But what it's really about is a character having to deal with more responsibility for the first time or a character who doesn't ask for help often having to ask their nemesis for help. And it's once you find the fun plot, you then have to make sure there's an emotional story that's character driven that goes with it. And so sometimes you have a bunch of really fun scenes and you stop and say, well, we don't really have an impactful story here. We don't have a character driven story. And so you take it apart. I love when you say you put yourself in that uh, character's shoe, you know, how do you even keep track of these arbitrary abstract you know, mystical characters. I feel like not being a writer, if I'm sitting in the room, be like, who, wait, who is this guy again? Like, you know, like, what is a piece of paper to look at? Like this person, this abstraction you're talking about, like, how do you even zoom in on that? Certainly 
it helps when uh, I've exclusively worked on the first season of shows. And then with Santa Clarita Diet, I've also worked on season two and season three subsequently, but I've always been there at the beginning of a show. And there is really important work that happens in those first couple of weeks where we're not even like figuring out stories yet. We're just talking about the characters. And we spend a lot of time, obviously in the first, when you're brought onto a pilot a show, they've already written the first episode for the most part. And so there's a little something to go off of, but we then spend a good amount of time figuring out what are all the other parts of these characters? Who are the side characters? How do they all relate with each other? What are fun dynamics between each other? And there's a lot of just open pitching and some stuff that sticks and some that doesn't. And that's kind of, I think, the real value of bringing in a writer's room is that you bring in a diverse group of people with different ideas and perspectives and experiences, and they just offer up characteristics and qualities about these characters. And we have more than we'll need and we kind of narrow it down and whittle it, whittle it down and figure out who these characters are. They become less abstract. They become more concrete. Wow. I love that. And you mentioned diversity. It feels like I'm doing a 180 right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I got to say, the reason is, I mean, people people can really see you on the screen right now. Um, one thing they don't know is that you are half Chinese and um, your mom is Chinese. And I got I have the pleasure to really meet both of your parents, got to know your younger sister as well. As somebody working the creative field and someone who loves watching movies and TV shows, big part of my life, I've seen the credit when I couldn't avoid them back in the days. And I just remember seeing very, very few people with the Chinese last names or seeing pictures of the writer's room and realize they're all white and they're all fit a certain profile. But you're different. Like, what are what are your thoughts or your take on that working in the industry? Well, I. It's funny you should mention the credits. Uh, I feel like growing up as a kid, I had no awareness of Hollywood at all. Like, there were names in the credits, but it didn't register with me that someone wrote that. I would just watch TV and be like, "Oh, that was a thing that made it." Just oh, it just happened, and it's become really interesting. It only was in college that I realized like, oh shoot, there are people who get to do this as a job and I want to pursue that. And coming out here, like I, it is a whiter and more male industry. Uh, I think in the last few years, there's been a lot more awareness and push towards diversity. I've worked in six writers' rooms with varying degrees of diversity in it. I'm certainly aware of it as someone who is a diverse writer. Uh, kind of the diversity in the room. I think that there is this push right now to have more women writers, more writers of color. I, what I hope is that it, the push results in more creators and high-level writers who are women or of color. There are a lot of programs right now that are diversity programs to get people their first writing jobs often, to become a staff writer, the lowest level writer. And there's diversity funds that can help pay for those level writer, first low level writers. And my first two jobs were I was paid out of this diversity fund, so I'm like very appreciative and grateful and aware of how diversity played a role in my own career. The next step is then getting those subsequent jobs, getting those mid level writer jobs. Once you get your foot in the door, staying in the door, and then for executives to empower these writers to have their own shows and be creators ultimately. So for him, and I think that shows benefit from diversity and that can be many different things. You know, it's not just white versus not white or male versus female. Although I think there, it is good to have that type of diversity of voice, but where you grew up, you know, who your parents were, what your, what your wealth is. There's so many different things that bring different perspective. And I think, that's why you have a writer's room is that you can bring more perspectives. And so the show and the world and the characters just feel fuller. When it comes to perspectives and in a writer's room, part of me working, the part of me that spent 12 years in advertising and marketing just cringe. It's like, oh my God, people in the room. I remember being in a meeting as small as two to three people and they just cannot agree on things that are not even all that important. So how scary or how fun is it to be with 15 people? And now you're advocating di- you know, diversity and perspectives and people are going to come in and know even less about each other, perhaps agree on fewer things. I mean, how does that work? 
Yeah, well, there will be disagreements. And I think, you know, to be a good television writer requires interpersonal skills. You know, it's one thing to be someone who knows story and character and dialogue. And those are really important qualities to be a writer in general. But to work in a television medium, you have to be able to get along with people because you're in a room together for eight, 10 hours a day because you're just having discussions and having to make decisions. And so part of it definitely falls to the creator or the the showrunner whose job is to moderate these conversations and make decisions and be firm in their decisions and kind of make it clear, like, this is what we're doing. This is what we're not doing when it is time to discuss and to kind of police the behavior of writers. But on a personal level, you need to, I found like not have an ego that if you truly believe that a writer's room produced the best results because there is creative disagreement or creative cooperation, you need to recognize that just as much as your idea can make someone else's thing better, and that's the value you bring, is that someone else has an idea or a joke or something that is better than your own. And so you need to, you can't be precious about everything that you pitch or you create. And so it definitely is a learning process that when your jokes or your story gets rewritten, it's not personal. I envision, so as you're describing, I envision like a bigger room with some windows and then like a big, either like a round table or, you know, like forms almost like a square, like it's empty in the middle, but people like to manage so many people, you have to kind of spread them out. Like what is the setup like? So generally it's just a, you know, an oval round table, rectangular table that everyone sits around. Um, And so the rooms, I mean, the biggest room I have been in was 15 people and the smallest was four people. Uh, So it definitely has different feelings of claustrophobia or, or, (laughs) or, or emptiness, but yeah, it's all of us just sitting around this one table and no one has their computers. The only person with the computer usually is the writer's assistant and they're the ones who are taking notes on everything. So we just have, most part, just like a pad of paper or like some scripts and we're just doing stuff by hand or doodling or taking notes. No way. I'm so shocked. When you have a computer, when you've been writing on a computer for a while, like writing on a notepad becomes really difficult. Like spelling becomes very challenging. It's, I find it, yeah, I mean, I find it much less distracting, which is nice, is that... Uh, this assistant, their job and their it's a, they do such important work is they're taking notes on everything that's being said, you know, a lot of which won't end up getting used, but they're chronicling everything. So later when we go to outline, we have all the notes to help us do the outline. When we go to script, like we have all those old jokes that we can put in, we can keep track of our stories. And when we get to the script rewrite phase, when we come back from our week away with the script, their computer gets linked up to a TV monitor so we can all see the edits and the assistant is the one at the computer typing the dialogue that we are saying at them. As the writers without the computers or like with your distractions, I find that sometimes doodling helps me focus. Yeah, but it's, I find it actually quite freeing not to have my computer in front of me all day. Love it. And you, but your cell phone's still in front of you or no? Uh, different showrunners have different, you know, preferences for how they want their phone system. You know, I usually keep mine on do not disturb. So I don't look at it except, you know, if we take a break or I go to get like a water from the kitchen, I'll check my phone, see if I have any messages, but yeah, I try to keep it away. Got it. So where, where do you write on your own for that one week? I mean, do you go to Starbucks? Do you stay where you are in your office? I mean, how crazy do you, do you get <laughs> Uh, I will write a lot from my apartment and then I will also go to a couple coffee shops. I find that I work best in like three hour stints. And so if I sit down in, in one place and try to work for like six hours, I'll just peter off in productivity. So typically I'll work for a chunk. And once I've hit that little wall, instead of pushing through, I'll like pack up my stuff, move to a new location you know, get a little food and then I start again. And so by giving myself that hour break where I feel like I wouldn't be productive anyway, I kind of reset and then start working. And that's often helped for me by a change of scenery. Yeah, love it. And you probably have heard of this thing called the writer's block. And and I think for, for people like me, the pressure isn't as high because to be honest, like we create our own stories. If something I outline doesn't work today, I'll just take something else out from 
the my Trello board or whatever, wherever the ideas are stored. I think for you, the stakes are much higher because you have that outline and you have to develop that story. You can't start working on some other project. So how how do you then, like if, if you are blocked, what do you do to unblock? It's amazing what a deadline does for me. Like if I'm told I need to be back in this room in a week, and sometimes it's been as little as like four days. And for me, I feel like I will always fill the time. If I tell myself I have a month to do it, I'll take a full month to do something. And so I'm always shocked when I write these scripts in a week. And then I'm like, oh, great. When I'm in between jobs, when I have all this free time in the world, I can do another script in a week and it will take me forever. And so definitely having a deadline helps me. I'll manufacture deadlines for myself during my free time when I'm working on my own projects, like, and I'll hold myself accountable. I'll tell someone else, like, I'm going to send you an outline to read in a week. And then I'll work on it. Or like, I'm going to send you the first 10 pages of the script. And so I hold myself accountable by telling them, I find for writer's block, sometimes you have to just push through and you have no choice. But when there is flexibility, I try to go to whatever is exciting me. So if I know that in this larger story, like this scene is really fun, like I'm going to go write that scene first because it will get me going. Or like I, there's this, there's a character dynamic that I feel like I really understand or feels fresh. I'm going to do that. And my hope is that by doing those scenes and doing writing that I know I can do, it'll either give me momentum and now I can go tackle the other stuff. I'll discover something in those scenes that'll help me better understand the scenes that I feel were giving me difficulty. When I have the luxury, I will try to do the scenes that feel easier to me, but not just because it's a thing to check off the box, but hopefully it's something that will give me some momentum to do the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm getting to know more and more. Hi there, this is Fei Wu, and thank you for listening to the Face World podcast. Today on our show, I'm joined by Ben Smith, writer, producer, director. His most recent project is HBO's top show, Barry. Coming from a multicultural background, Ben is often the diversity in a writer's room. Discover his journey from college to being a recognized writer in Hollywood. Like how much of what you write is like dialogues, like conversations between two or a group of people? And how much of that is you painting the context or setting the background? Certainly the dialogue is all us. And that's like a very important part of it. In the script, so you have the dialogue and then you have what's called like stage directions, which are action text, which is kind of like character walk, walks to the door and crosses to the couch. Or in the background, we see someone get out of their car. There is kind of a balance between wanting to provide the information that's necessary and not wanting to overwrite, which one is a function of length of script. Like we're supposed to keep our scripts around a certain length and you don't want to just fill it up with with just this action text. Uh, But part of it also is kind of an unspoken courtesy, I think, with the directors that our job is to write and the director's job is to direct. And we shouldn't give every description, like the camera starts here and lifts. And as it pans, we discover this, this, and this, because that's their job. You know, there's some things that we as the writers feel very strongly about. And so we think that we need to include it so that that story point gets across or that that moment is clear. And so sometimes we'll, if it is important to say that they step out of the car wearing these boots, because that like, you know, we see these two boots hit the ground, like that shot's very clear to us because that'll help sell who this character is. Mm -hmm. We'll put it, but otherwise that's something for to be discussed later. The director will talk to the writers, you know, it is a balance between not wanting to over direct and wanting to make sure there's enough information that the story that we want to tell is clear. So it sounds like you do work fairly potentially closely with the producers and directors as well, or maybe you know, depending on the show, somebody in the interim might kind of help fill in the blanks or kind of further elaborate on the situation. So, um, yeah. And it's, there's a difference I've heard between television and film where in TV, the writers are the most powerful. Uh, and part of that is because directors rotate directors, you know, each episode for the most part, there'll be a new director. And so they're basically a visitor to set. 
And so they, there's the show that's already existing. They're coming to steward the ship or, and, you know, run the show for a week. Uh, but they want to continue the show that's already been going. So it's their job to kind of come in and talk to the head writer, you know, the head writer and be like, are the, do you do these types of shots? Do you ever do a handheld camera shot? It's like, no, we don't do that. Or do you do shots that are on like close-ups of faces? We don't do that. So you kind of have to, this directors come in and learn the language, the visual language and the storytelling style of the show. And it's their job to recreate the style of the show. Yeah, yeah. That makes, that's very fascinating to me and what the end product will look like. So I would like to talk about your origin stories for a moment. And I'm also very curious about your personal projects, uh, the projects that you choose to, to develop as well. So does being half Chinese, I mean, does that ever come up for you? I mean, how do you feel about it? And I will just premise by saying that like after living in the U.S. myself for half of my life, having grown up in China, oftentimes I don't think of myself as being Asian until I go back to China. It's like, why does everybody have black hair? What's going on here? Like I actually lose touch with, you know, with maybe something seen as fundamental. So like, what, what are your thoughts? I feel like maybe similar to what you're describing, I didn't think about my ethnicity that much growing up. Like I grew up in a very diverse town, uh, hometown Lexington, Massachusetts, and went to like a very diverse college. And then LA is very diverse as well. That I felt like I felt both Chinese and white and also not Chinese and not white and never othered. I never felt like excluded from a group. I was actually, I think, very proud and excited to be half Asian. It felt special and unique. I think that's kind of actually my main relationship with my with being half Asian. I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, and it was different. And I felt like I was both a part of a lot of culture and then also unique in myself. In the last few years, started to have a greater appreciation of being Asian and like more interest in my Asian heritage. And you know what I think it's really interesting as well is that both of your parents are doctors. How did you even come up with the idea of being a writer and how like how did they respond to it? <laughs> Maybe a little surprised. Yeah, so yeah, they're both doctors and definitely grew up, you know, around the dining room table with them talking what to me sounded like a whole different language, you know, just all these medicine terms back and forth. And there was a point when I was really young when I wanted to be a pediatric oncologist, like very specific. And then that I don't. I went through a whole bunch of stuff that I wanted, and then kind of when I went to college, my thought was that I would go into government and politics, and I was interested in law um, and international relations. Uh, kind of throughout high school and in college, I did theater stuff, and I did improv comedy, and I would do plays, and I would make movies with friends. Whenever we had a class project, we'd try to see if we could do a film instead. And so that was always something that was very fun for me and creatively fulfilling. And it was a very social activity for me. And I got to be with my closest friends. But I didn't know or think of it as a professional opportunity until junior year of college when some other writers I knew were talking about moving to LA or moving to New York and pursuing this. And that's kind of when I realized that this could be a career. And that was incredibly exciting to me that what I thought would always be an extracurricular could be a profession. But they have always been incredibly supportive of everything I've done. With all my interests growing up, they were always gave me opportunities. You know, if this is something I'm into, like great, let's let's find out what you can, what programs that exist, what uh, extra classes you can take, what special events we can go to. So they were always trying to encourage my interests, and I think you know, medicine and and film are very different, but. I would always see the way they approach things was just do the best you can always do. And so I think, you know, they've been wildly supportive and of and very proud of everything. There's no bigger fan than my mom on Facebook for the shows I've worked on. You mentioned about uh, the Diversity Writers Fund, uh, something to that effect. I mean, do you remember how you... I mean, a lot of our listeners love to find out how you break in, like your, your first bag of gold or like how... Did you see like an epiphany or just like where little by little, everybody's experience is different? Like what was your collection of memory of the very beginning of things? Very first job. You know, so I 
was very fortunate in that uh, when I came out to LA, I had an agent and a manager already working with me. And it is kind of a, a very difficult catch-22, I think, in terms of getting representation that a lot of representatives don't want to sign you until you get work, but also it's very hard to get work until you are represented because they are in many ways the gatekeeper that get your scripts and your name onto the desks of these people hiring. So I was very lucky when we when I signed with them and they're like, all right, our goal this year is to get you a staff writer job on TV. And that was not what I was expecting. I was expecting like, we're trying to become a writer's assistant. I thought it was like lower. And they basically recalibrated my expectations. Like we, this is where we're aiming for. This is what we're shooting for. And so that was helpful right off the bat. Like this is how I should frame my, my expectations. And I spent the next like six months working on a couple scripts and trying to get them in good shape. It all happened really quickly. Um, they sent one of these scripts to the creators of Trophy Wife who responded to the material, brought me in. They also, turns out, both went to Harvard. Sarah Haskins and Emily Halpern, they're incredible. Uh, and I was aware of both of them. They did not really know who I was. Uh, <laughs> and But I think in that meeting, they were like, oh, this is really exciting. This is a script we liked. This was a person that we feel some semblance of connection to. And I think they really took it upon themselves that like we have money and spot for one more low level writer. Let's hire this person and we're going to kind of mentor them. And so I totally am indebted to the two of them for taking a flyer on me and for not just hiring me, but then uh, working with me and kind of setting me off on this trajectory. So to distill it, like it came down to hopefully having material that was good, a good script, and then also just finding good people who want to work with you and who uh, will go out of their way to be like a good collaborator and good partner. Hi there, this is Fei Wu, and thank you for listening to the Face World podcast. Today on our show, I'm joined by Ben Smith, writer, producer, director. His most recent project is HBO's top show, Barry. Coming from a multicultural background, Ben is often the diversity in a writer's room. Discover his journey from college to being a recognized writer in Hollywood. I really want to talk about your project on Vimeo. And on top of all the other things that you're working on, I mean, you are someone who started off your own project as a writer, as a director, as a producer. What, what, where did the interest come from? Okay, yeah. So this is a short film that I made uh, with my friend Megan a couple of years ago. And it came about initially because writers do a lot of writing that never sees the light of day. You know, we write these scripts that our agents read, that the people hiring us read. That's kind of it. And these are the projects that are my own ideas or are kind of maybe feel the most personal to me or that I'm most excited about. And it was a big difference that that kind of creative lifestyle than what I got into the arts with initially, which was improv, where you create something right there in the moment in front of an audience and you immediately get response. You get to interact and, and kind of have that sharing of, of creative ideas and that response and, and interaction. And that was the polar opposite of writing a script that no one ever reads. And so the idea to make a short film was born out of, I want to just make something that I actually wrote and get to share it with people. And so initially the idea was like, let's make something that's pretty self-contained, that's easy to make, that only requires a couple actors, a couple locations. And so we came up with this story together. I wrote it and we decided to direct it together. And then we had the really good fortune of partnering up with this producer, Josh, who had a vision for something bigger. So we initially were just going to do it on our own camera with a couple of friends. And then all of a sudden we had these really wonderful actors, Juno Temple and John Bass get attached. Uh, we got like nice equipment, these beautiful locations and houses, and it became a much more serious production. Um, so it was a very cool learning experience on the fly, but it was all born out of this want to get to actually share with other people uh, a story that we made ourselves. Yeah, and how long how long did it take to make that? We filmed it in four days. 
So we filmed it two weekends. So like a Friday, Saturday, or a, and then like a Saturday, Sunday, the next weekend. Wow. What about a rehearsal, like before pre-production and then editing? Like how long did those take? So we did one table read with just the two main actors. And it was really cool to hear it read because it was something that I'd written and I heard so clearly in my head. And then when they read it, some parts, there were jokes that I didn't know existed. I was like, that's really funny when you said that. And I didn't even think that was going to be funny. It wasn't intended, but you bring something to the performance. Or there were moments that I thought were really serious. They were played differently. We made changes based on that. I went and did some rewrites based off of their read. But that was kind of the extent of rehearsal. And then on set, we would run through the lines. Megan and I would kind of go through the blocking with the actors and I mean, we're very lucky. These John and Juno are like very professional and there were very little big changes we had to make in their performances. They really understood it and got it from the beginning. Editing did take a little bit of a while. We had a wonderful editor. Uh, I think our original thing came in at like 30 minutes, 35 minutes or something like that, which was just way too long. And so it was an exercise in cutting it down. But I think the last like 10 minutes more or less the editor from the original cut that he made, but we kept it the same. Like he totally nailed it. And it was kind of the first half of the movie we had to trim down and kind of find cuts to speed it up a little bit. One thing you mentioned, um, kind of very briefly, I think in our email exchanges, it really touched me deeply is that even though we are working on drastically different type of shows and such, you too invested a lot of your own money into building this. And, you know, you're much younger than I am. And for me to kind of gather that courage and make that decision for my film, how do you feel now? It's a couple of years later, I guess. How do you, or a year later, how do you feel about this decision of yours that you made (laughs) to do this? Uh, I'm so happy to have made it, like it, or both. I'm happy to make it and I have no regrets about spending the money to do it. I mean, we talked earlier about the stated goal was to get to just make something to share that I'd wrote. And that was achieved and that was really cool. And it was a very exciting experience to get to have feedback from people. And I was like really, really proud of what we what we produced in the the final products. So that was really positive. And I think it confirmed to me that I'm interested in directing other projects in the future and that that it was a really stressful but exciting experience to be on set and to collaborate was really amazing. And so it kind of reinforced this idea in me that this is something that I know I want to do. And then it was just an incredible learning experience. You know, I up to that point had come from the perspective of a writer. And it was really cool to get to direct, to get to be part of editing, to get to work closely with actors. Cause I think it does make you think differently about writing or about storytelling in general. I mean, I think, you know, earlier we talked about dialogue versus the action text. I think that as a writer, there can be a crutch where you think just about the dialogue, you know, that everything that needs to be expressed needs to be stated or, or, you know, one of the characters has to say it out loud. And I think getting to work with actors and with getting to direct you develop a trust that like other people will say it for you. You don't have to be as explicit. An actor will sell it with a look or with like the tone of their voice, or it was a cool and worthwhile experience to appreciate all the other ways to tell what you need to tell. And so I think that's affected my writing sense. And I think that I approach writing with a more holistic viewpoint. The next step is that you know, Megan and I have interest in making other short films or other projects. And I think that we're like really happy with how this turned out. And if there is more for it, for me too, then great. Uh, But otherwise, you know, the best part was getting to make it and work and collaborate with the rest of the crew and the, the cast. And so I think that's the part that we're most excited about next is just to get to do the experience all over again. Oh, that excites me. Because so much of, I mean, the way that we are brought up, or and I know that the way we're educated is uh, do this, and then and then we want to end up doing more. And I think when it comes to the less pure side of the the creative 
life is, okay, now you did this, how you're going to make money from it and how quickly you should make money from it. And you should, you should get, be famous. I mean, all these things are kind of taken away from the purity of the art form. But regardless how little sleep I had shooting the documentary, part of me was thinking, oh my God, I want to do this at least like uh, once a year. I I was telling my... Well, I think also, I feel like you have to enjoy the pure part of the process because that's like what 99% of your time will be spent doing, you know? Like on a TV show, we spend 10 hours a day in a room for months just only interacting with the other writers. If I don't enjoy that, then if I'm only just waiting for the audience response for like the 30 minutes that end up being made that come out months later, and I only hear about like on Twitter and someone's review, like that's not going to sustain me. Like what's going to sustain me is enjoying the messiness and the fun of that writer's room all day. Like that, the process has to be what's fun because that's what you're doing the whole time. Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode, and I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoy what you heard, it will be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Face Royal podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you're on your mobile phone, just search for Face Royal podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support.